Good morning. So over the last few days, we've uh, heard many um, uh, repeated statements about the role our botanic gardens uh, can, should, and do play in conservation. And we brought together this panel um, to tell some stories about how very different organizations have conversations first that then lead to really important conservation efforts. So let me begin by introducing myself and my colleagues. I'm Jean Franzik. I am president and CEO of the Chicago Botanic Garden, which is a young garden. It's 45 years old. Um, it gets about a million visitors a year. It's well balanced uh, across horticulture, science, and education. I have uh, my colleague, uh, Princess Basma Bint Ali, who is founder of the Royal Botanic Garden of Jordan, and that is a garden dedicated to the protection of native species and habitats. And it is so young, so new, that it is not yet open to the public. Jonas Miller, Mueller, excuse me, is the senior research leader with Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, an organization that is the oldest among us at more than 250 years young. And so our intent today is to prompt a discussion amongst ourselves that really helps us think broadly about how we engage more people uh, in conversations about conservation. And I, I am a simple person. I think in threes. And in this context, I have three kind of general uh, rules that help me. One is to remember uh, that not everyone likes what we like and not everyone knows what we know. The second rule that's important is repeat, 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 but with creativity. And my third rule is to work with partners, not just whom we like, but um, those partners who can do the thing that we as organizations or individuals could not do on our own. So I'm going to begin with something to illustrate my first rule which is, um, so my first rule that not everyone likes what we like. This is an image from uh, a real estate uh, for sale uh, uh, application. When I moved back to Chicago about a year ago, I had to buy a house and my husband and I wanted a house with a tiny little garden. So in February in Chicago, which is dark and cold and gray, we went to go see uh, the house associated with this picture. And on that cold and snowy day, the back garden looked exactly like that with this bright green grass. And I knew immediately on looking at it that it was plastic and I was absolutely fundamentally horrified. And I asked the realtor what, what was up with the lawn. I knew what the answer was, but I asked that question anyway. And with great happiness, she said, isn't it fantastic? There's no fuss, there's no bother. It is green year round. And I of course was horrified but took the advantage of the teachable moment, right? The teachable moment for me, not for her, to remind myself that not everyone cares about living plants, dignity or otherwise, that not everyone cares about green and growing things. And for somebody who runs a botanic garter, garden, that is a very, very good reminder because we have to begin our conversations with people who don't like what we like, uh, who are not specialists, but whom we need on side if we're to move our conversations about conservation forward. My second rule of thumb, remember, is repeat, repeat, repeat. And many of us uh, are probably bored silly with the extent to which these Titan arums are blooming in our gardens. So this was our fifth bloom in 18 months that happened in Chicago. And this image is from May. And we had to find a way to tell the story about this extraordinary and rare plant, but in a different way that was going to gain people's attention. And so the opportunity in this instance was to focus purely on the conservation messages and talk about the vulnerability of the plant's native habitat, about how we were pollinating it, sharing its DNA with other institutions around the globe, um, and how important it was to uh, protect threatened plants and plant communities. But we had to do our work very, very differently. But my bigger story today is on a level of public policy. So we at the Garden in Chicago have been leading a conversation uh, among NGOs and other government agencies to really advance our national seed strategy, which is focusing on getting um, the right seed in the right place at the right time. 
and we knew what the risks were to implementing the strategy and really felt like we needed a response at a public policy level and that the best way to encourage more people to study plant science and botany, to encourage seed collecting, genetic research, get government agencies responsible for responding to catastrophic events like wildfires, uh, floods, and hurricanes um, was through legislation. And the best way to get legislation uh, with any chance of passing, uh, which is always risky, is if you have bipartisan support. And we couldn't do this on our own. The key to getting bipartisan support in our instance that led to this bill being introduced in Congress was working with this organization, the Venerable Garden Club of America. This is an organization that is more than 100 years old. They are known more for horticultural displays than conservation. Uh, they are an establishment organization, I would say, with significant presence in the northeastern part of the country, but clubs across the country. Um, despite having a reputation more for floral displays, they have a strong history in conservation and environmental protection, very strong work in promoting um, students through scholarships, huge number of scholarships every year, supporting summer field work, graduate research missions, and things like that. They are not just about beautiful plantings in the town square. It was their leadership, their support, that allowed us to get the bipartisan um, um, uh, support that we needed to introduce that bill into Congress. And indeed, it got us where we wanted to be, saying we had to protect the natural environment through providing student loan forgiveness for those who were studying botany and plant science, that federal agencies would be required to use native seeds in replanting after catastrophic events, and it was only because we had this group, the Garden Club of America, on side that elected officials on both sides of a very, very divided political aisle uh, were able to sign on and pay attention to our work. So, uh, in summary, my three rules. Uh, remember, not everyone likes what we like. Repeat, repeat, repeat with creativity and work with partners who are able to do what you cannot do. I introduce now my, my colleague, Princess Basma, uh, from the Royal Botanic Gardens of Jordan to talk about her um, work and her examples. So, Princess Basma. Thank you very much, Jean. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Habib. Um, today, it's not really a formal presentation that I'll be giving, but more of a conversation so we can start opening the floor, hopefully after, for questions. So I just want to give you a brief of how we started as a garden and how we ended up being where we are today with the um, community-based rangeland rehabilitation program. Um, at the start, the con conservation was at the very heart of the founding of the garden in Jordan because um, we could see the habitat degradation and the soil uh, loss that was happening occurring in Jordan. As, as you can see in the photograph um, dated around the 70s, there's not much uh, cover there. And uh, this was really increasing at a very rapid rate. And I thought, well, we have to do something about it, yet we had very limited amount of information concerning our native species. So um, I decided to do the Botanic Garden to combat that. And this is why we're one of the youngest, yet we're lucky enough, because we're the youngest, we can address these issues in a more flexible way. Now the, pre the premise that we're working under is that man or communities um, is an essential part of the conservation formula because we are and we have been part of the ecosystems for over well over 10,000 years. And so if we want it to be sustainable in the future, um, all our efforts and have really true conservation, we have to integrate man as part of our conservation formula. Now, uh, it's very interesting that the Royal Botanic Garden in Tel Ruman has three different communities living al um, around us. We have the weekend holiday homeowners who live in the capital, and you can just see their houses in one of the pictures, the top uh, picture. Then you've got the local villagers 
of the village of Tel Ruman community, as well as the herding community, and each one really didn't have much communication with the other. Now this made our garden quite unique because this is how we based our partnership. And it really started, the partnership started well before the core of our botanic garden work um, actually started. Um, and it was purely not a, a part of a studied agenda, but pure circumstances that led us to this work. So once we decided on a site, we were faced with the ironic dilemma that the herding community have been there for since you know the longest time. And who were we to come and say, we're going to fence up this area, and they're no longer allowed to come and, and graze in these lands. Um, but at the same time, Herding and overgrazing was one of the major destructive forces in Jordan, not only on the site, but all over Jordan itself. And we really needed to study the soil seed bank of the site itself to see how are we going to approach the restoration of uh, the location and study it. So that's when the beginning of the CBRR program, the Community-Based Rangeland Rehabilitation Program, first started. It was quite simple because what we did is we thought, okay, what we can do now is we'll study the biomass of the site and we'll try to calculate how much they would have um, fed their sheep in terms of biomass and then we'll give them fodder supplementation. But then we thought, okay, we can do that at the very start, but would it really solve the problem of our habitats being overgrazed outside of the site? and no, it wouldn't. So we took it a step further, and we always, which we always had in mind that whatever we do in the garden has to be practical, not too complicated, and not too expensive, that we can actually make it replicable, not only in Jordan, but also on a regional level, because within the region, everyone s suffers from the same overgrazing issue. And the other thing is that we had to keep in mind that just as we have, the, the environmentalists, the right to protect our plants, they also too have a right, the herding community, they also have a right to live, and I would say this word here, a dignified life. So they really had a lot of um, pressure because it was at the same time as the economic collapse, the world's economic collapse, and the fodder prices were very high, so we couldn't take that away from them, the grazing lands, and have them pay more for fodder. And the um, overgrazing was also an epidemic all over Jordan. But what we said, we'll study it in such a way that from our studies we can turn the table and have those who are the negative aspect in this formula become the positive. And that's exactly what happened. So what we did is we trained them in issues like managed grazing, how to keep records, business, how to run your own business. Many of them didn't even know they were losing money because they had a sheep. When they needed the cash, they, all they had to do is go to the market and sell their sheep and then they would have cash in hand. So they unwittingly thought they were always rich in cash. But after doing the business plans and teaching them these small skills, they realized that there's so much more to manage grazing than before. We started only with five families, and then I'm happy to say right now, we have over, uh, covered over 100% of the herding community in Tel Ruman, and uh, even the villagers, when they saw the economic benefits, the health benefits, of the herding communities have even started, um, decided to become uh, herding, uh, you know, raise sheep, I mean, as well. But this transfer of knowledge was not just from us to them. It was also from them to us. We learned from them as much as uh, they learned from us. And it's uh, something that um, can be applicable in not just um, the traditional, as you can see here, Umm Muhammad, is using the, the raw sheep uh, wool to give them to um, weave the, the material there in her on her lap. 
but also these are dying skills that we have to keep alive. We cannot forget these skills. And with a new generation of technology and everything, there, we're forgetting these skills and it's a dying tradition that we have to also conserve, not only just the, the plants and the flora, but also our cultural heritage that we have to maintain. But on top of all this, there's an added value of the CBRR, which I would like to highlight, is the, the herders of this community became the ambassadors of managed grazing in other communities, and we would take them to an area, for example, Bani Hashem, which is completely um, far away from where the Tel Roman site is, and they start talking from herder to herder, which is much more easier than having the experts go and try and convince them. And the Bani Hashem uh, community was actually part of the IUCN's new initiative to bring the HEMA system back in. Uh, we also participate in, uh, participated in the National Rangeland Strategy and the new Environmental Protection Law is fifth, uh, and the fifth National Biodiversity Report. So all this part of the CBRR, which merely started as giving replacement fodder to a herding community because we didn't feel that we had the right to take this away from them, ended up in developing national strategies, and this we didn't foresee in, in at the very start. And it also led us to hold a national workshop on rangeland management, and it was in an effort to widen the audience and in the conversation on conservation. And as a consequence of this, we were able, we realized we were actually uh, addressing uh, seven of the targets of the, um, the strategic development goals. One, which is no poverty, two, zero hunger, three, good health and well-being, four, quality education, 13, climate action, and 15, life on land. But the fifth is where I would like to, um, the fifth target is I would like to talk more about, and that is gender equality. And through our women's empowerment over here. This is quite interesting because it's a very unique initiative. And it addresses the question we had discussed earlier, which is how do botanic gardens broadly involve the general public in the conversation on conservation. And I'm just gonna describe you what happened. We had invited a, a Danish composer, opera composer to the garden, Lien uh, Tjernhoi, and she was so inspired by the site and she was so inspired by the work and the various partnerships that we cultivated that she decided to write an opera specially uh, for the Royal Botanic Garden. And it wasn't just any opera, it's actually a food opera, so it's interactive. And the reason it's a food opera, because she met with the ladies of Tel Roman, and she tasted their traditional food. And she said, well, why don't we bring that back to Denmark and we have a cross-cultural exchange. So it, go, it goes beyond just conserving flora. We use the raw materials, which are, is our plants, that enhance these foods. And then we teach, we empower the women to, we help them facilitate them to do a co-op, a cooperative uh, non-governmental entity. And then we taught them how to organize themselves and do a product so they can bring new income streams to their um, families. And it's worked very, very well. And in the picture, the lower right hand picture, you can see one of the top chefs from Denmark who came and stayed with the woman for about two weeks, 10 days, and she worked with the woman using the, the jamid, which is the sun-dried yogurt. Here you see it in, in the center uh, photo, but applied in a very different Danish way. And they had the cultural exchange of preparing different dishes. But we also, and, and that was very, very empowering for both sides of the story. And the other uh, photo on the left, bottom left hand is the woman being taught on social media. We take social media for granted, but these women in these rural areas don't have, they do have connection, but they've never been taught how to do it. 
So this is another way to have them reach out to bigger markets. And I have to say that also, not only on the social media or a cultural exchange, but we were able to teach them how to produce these products in a very high standards that meet the standards of both the Ministry of Environment and Food in Denmark and also the Food and Drug Administration in, in Jordan. So they can sell it internationally. And this is a different, different um, approach to conservation that not only empowers women, but it also has an intangible value of building relationships between the women, between the community there. Before the Royal Botanic Garden came, none of the communities were talking. Now what they've done is they've actually have a space within their center to come and congregate and they've ha they have much stronger ties because at the end of the day, everyone wants one thing and that's to live a life of dignity and they really are not out there to destroy or to destruct any of our environment, but they just want to live. And we can become the facilitators of how they can do it in a sustainable way for the future. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's very difficult for me to match that a great example. Um, I don't have prepared a uh, formal presentation. I just want to show you a few slides um, and give you a little bit of a personal experience here working for the Royal Botanic Gardens uh, queue. Um, and in particular, uh, the Millennium Seed Bank and our Millennium Seed Bank partnership, which is so natural now for us working uh, in partnerships day in, day out. Uh, the picture, the map that you see here uh, represents with the, with the colored um, uh, in countries the status of our partnership, our global network of partners at the end of our first international phase, which was a 10 years effort starting in 2000 with the aim uh, to collect 10% of the world's flora as high quality seeds, 24,200 species at the time. We started that international phase with 18 core countries um, with whom we negotiated, sometimes in long and tedious processes, access and benefit sharing agreements that relates, related back directly to the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Global Strategy for Plant conservation and in those 10 years from those 18 core countries, the partnership grew to the status that you see there represented on the map. Um, when I joined Q in 2005, we just had added the partners in Europe. I was responsible for our European Seed Conservation Network, ENSCONET, and uh, there were a few talks yesterday uh, yesterday, no, the day before yesterday, uh, about that. Those partners in the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership, really, um, we share the passion um, for plant conservation. We have a joint interest in seed banking, even if we come from various different backgrounds, um, from botanic gardens, of course, university institutes, so some of our partners were more interested in the research, the seed biological questions from a scientific point of view. Uh, we had agricultural gene banks and forest gene banks um, represented, and again, both of those themes featured heavily on uh, Tuesday. And since then, uh, the network has further grown. Um, we have the new target to collect 25% of the world's flora uh, in, in, in those current next 10 years until the end of 2020. And it was my privilege then to think strategically, okay, where are those biodiverse countries, the, the, the global hotspots for plant diversity, which the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership currently does not cover, where are those countries with whom we need to partner up? Um, and as you can see, the network has 
expanded and still is expanded, I would, I would estimate it's grown by about 20% since, uh, since that phase started. That is in terms of actual number of partners uh, and also uh, the access to plant species found in those countries. Um, now an area that Q has rediscovered for itself is agriculture and our contribution to food security. And for those of you who came to Arinovi and my session on Tuesday, you will remember that slide that I showed. It was developed in the Crop Wild Relative project. What does it show? It's a heat map. Uh, areas in red here are those areas where crop wild relatives, so the closest undomesticated species um, uh, relatives of, of our crop varieties uh, are uh, distributed uh, and at the same time the areas from where uh, they've not been collected uh, where accessible gene bag accessions uh, do not exist. We looked at 1,080 plant species, crop wild relatives, astonishing 95% are not adequately represented in accessible gene bank accessions. 25% are represented with 10 or fewer accessions and 30% of those 1,080 species are not collected at all. So in this context, some years ago, the Global Crop Diversity Trust uh, approached Q and they asked, would you like to join a new big global initiative, uh, the Crop Wild Relative Project? We need you. We need your partners. We need, uh, uh, um, we need you in the project. If we want to collect Crop Wild Relative species to fill that gap that you see there on the map, uh, if you want to collect those crop wild relative species all over the world, we can't do it ourselves. Uh, we need partners, well-trained partners, knowledgeable partners, competent partners from all over the world to help us with that effort. And this is how the project came uh, to life and this is how we teamed up with the, with the Crop Trust. We activated our network of partners in the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership for this project. We added a few partner uh, uh, institutions in a, a few new countries. The Crop Trust did the same with their parallel network from the agricultural work. And what you can see here is again colored in those countries with institution in those countries uh, who partner with us in the Crop Wild Relative Project collecting at least some of those 1,080 crop wild relative species that we have identified as a gap. One often hears about the two worlds of uh, native, undomesticated, wild plant species and the agricultural, the, the crop conservation and unfortunately with sometimes, with a little overlap I should say, maybe with too little overlap, too little mutual interaction and I think this project nicely shows uh, how the two worlds, the wild and the crop worlds, can, can partner uh, together uh, uh, and, and make cross-disciplinary work here um, a success. Food security, and this is the underlying reason for the work that we are doing, is just too important to be addressed in isolation. And uh, Mari Haga in her plenary session on food security on Tuesday morning, I think, uh, made that point quite eloquently. And her pledge to the new Food Forever initiative uh, is, is very important in that respect. Collaboration goes beyond the collecting of those crop wild relatives um, uh, across the world. Uh, the partnership expands to the next project activity, which is the rebreeding. Rebreeding, that's the characterization of the collected material, the identification of, of useful traits for breeding. And as you can see, I, I quickly swap back and forwards. You see, it is a different set of partners with some overlap, but uh, uh, not, not a lot, again on a global scale. 
Um, and at one point, uh, we brought those two partnerships together, the collecting and the rebreeding partners, and I personally found this particularly inspiring, I have to say. It all depends, as always, on the people involved. Uh, these are a few photographs from a training course we organized last year in Malaysia at the Agricultural Research Institute there. Uh, you get to know each other, you visit each other, uh, build a better understanding for the situation in the country of the challenges maybe that the partners face, their needs, their competency, and that constant interaction as part of the project leads to uh, a trust and uh, a friendship. And that is what I personally find so inspiring about the work that I'm doing, uh, working in partnership, because at the end we share that pla passion for plant conservation. Thank you. So we have left plenty of time for uh, discussion and questions. And from those two examples, one um, at a national, a local scale with national impact and then probably international implications in terms of working together, a global initiative that brought together, I'd say, two disparate um, um, communities, the question I'd like to kick off with is if you could each tell us about the challenges that you face and how you overcame obstacles where you were, you were bringing people together that might never have been in the same room before or might have had some inherent kind of conflict or, or suspicion of, of the other. So if, if Princess Fosma could start. Yes, we had quite a few um, obstacles, to say the least. And the first of which was we didn't have a culture of botanic gardens um, in Jordan. And that started off uh, with n people not knowing from the highest level decision makers up to the herding uh, community level, they didn't know what we were about. So there was this mistrust of what are they doing. And there was a rumor going around that the princess wants her little garden there. Seriously, <laughs> and, and we had to build that trust up that we're doing this for all of us, not just one person for all of Jordan. And um, one of the ways when we, when, as I said, with the first five families, when the other families saw the benefits coming out of this program, that's when they came on board to become all of the herding community. So really it was a practical way when they saw the benefits, that's how uh, one of the aspects of, of of dealing with the obstacles in a quick two ways. Yeah. I might add, add to that from our perspective. Q Gardens is managing the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership, but uh, we make it very clear that we depend on the input and the commitment of all the partners across the partnership. So in effect, we not do seed conservation ourselves. We facilitate the work that is happening in each country. And that is a, a process that starts very on with the first visit uh, uh, to keep the communication going and um, to find out where the overlap of interest is and where we with our competence across the partnership can help uh, the partner country um, reach their individual targets. And if there's buy-in from both sides, then that is a good starting block for a successful cooperation. Great. We have some questions from the uh, audience this morning. There's a question down in the front. There, there's a microphone at each place. <laughs> Hi, my name is Esti and I'm from Indonesia and I'd like to ask a question to uh, the princess. Um, firstly, salamu alaikum and I'm very um, inspired with everything that you're doing in, in Jordan and I hope to extend something like it um, in Indonesia. And my first question is how many people have the knowledge transfer you've initiated received in Jordan? And um, how do you suggest to keep all sectors in Jordan involved in conservation given the uh, multiple benefits that it has? 
Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, as for the how many people, um, how many people were involved in the knowledge transfer? Actually, in terms of us, our staff, our leading staff member is here, Dr. Mustafa Lawit Wagif, Wagif, Wagif. Uh, stand up and another of his assistants. So basically, relatively two um, of our main staff members, but they had last year alone conducted over uh, many workshops. They've trained over 500 people um, on different uh, governmental level in institutions, NGOs, and also communities. And, and the reason for this is we didn't model it so that they would be dependent on us, but rather we empowered the local community so they would teach each other. And one of the important aspects of this, I didn't want to feel that I'm here coming as a botanic garden with the knowledge. It's a, it's a two-way partnership, and we, we wanted to cut the umbilical cords, as they say. So the, the, the strength of the model is that you empower the local communities and they teach the rest. And this way it can grow so much more faster um, than anything we, we could have done. That's on one level. And how can we involve all sectors? It's, it's really tough, I tell you. It's not very easy. But as um, Jean said, repeat, repeat, and keep on saying, and try to innovate the way you say and never keep quiet. And if you trust in what you're doing and believe in it, people will end up listening. I mean, it's been 20 years since the beginning of the garden, and we're still not open, but I'm always hopeful, inshallah. Thank you. Great. Other questions? I thought I saw one down front here. Yeah? Was this uh, one just a continuation of my colleague? Um, I wonder uh, how long it has been initiated, because uh, uh, earlier, it was, earlier it was said that um, it's not yet been opened or launched. Uh, I wonder the effect um, until uh, which, sta which stage that you're going to open it. That's one question. And another one to uh, Dr. Muller. Uh, Indonesia has been benefited from the Millennium Seed Bank um, uh, project. We had um, training course uh, last year, in, in, in this year actually, in Indonesia. But uh, I just want to ask, uh, what, is there a regulation yet on uh, APS, on the exchange of the uh, access benefit sharing, I mean, uh, exchange of the uh, seeds and others? And perhaps in the future, or we should think of a broader uh, joint project on also the digitation of the collection. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for your question. Um, I, I quickly mentioned access and benefit sharing uh, uh, when I was there at the, uh, at the, the speaker. Um, we refer to the Convention on Biological Diversity, now to Nagoya Protocol, uh, of course, and uh, um, uh, the, the, the first step in uh, building that partnership is to have a some sort of a formal agreement, a memorandum of collaboration or the access and benefit sharing agreement that I had uh, mentioned that defines exactly what the benefits are and a, a training course, knowledge transfer, joint publications of scientific output might well fall under that same category. And of course, you rightly say, uh, the, the rights and obligations uh, with regard to the plant material itself. So it is very difficult to give a, a, a general answer. It needs to be looked at in the context of those international conventions and then very specifically, what is the national legislation, in this case, the Republic of, of Indonesia? What does your legislation allow and not allow third parties to do with the material? And that refers, of course, to intellectual property right and then a, a, an adequate um, uh, use and, and benefit that would go back to the country of origin. Um, thank you for the question. As for our timeline, well, my dream was it started as an idea in 1999. I thought I would be done in five years and open. It's 20 years on, nearly. Uh, we're still not open, but what we have done is because, as I said, we didn't have 
very much um, information. So we had to start from sub-zero, developing what are native species, what is our, we just, alhamdulillah, published our first annotated checklist of the flora of Jordan. So there was a lot of research and scientific work that we had to get done and developing our seed bank and everything. So that's on the way and, and going very, very well, alhamdulillah. Um, as for opening to the public as an ecotourism aspect, that's really funded de depending on the funding. And if anyone's here willing to fund, we're more than welcome <laughs> to take. Um, but hopefully the soft opening will be inshallah, inshallah, in two, uh, 2020, inshallah. And, but I would like to also add on to regarding uh, the ABS, the um, access and benefit sharing. As for Jordan, what we had to do, we had to do the checklist to say these are our plants first. And then uh, we did also the red list, which was part and parcel. Um, but we have to also um, uh, write down their traditional knowledge which we got from the partnership with the um, herding community and other communities, um, the Atbarin, the herbalists. Um, and you have to um, digitize that and write it up and, and, and record everything. And then work with your government, as um, uh, Jonas said, and to see what already exists to be able to push your Ministry of Environments, because I know the Jeff has funds that will enable countries, because they really want to make the Nagoya Protocol um, working and, and, and ifalu. Um, so if you work and push your government to do that, and you be the catalyst, which is what we're doing, apply for a fund to develop your own local national uh, regulations in this regard with lawyers, specific lawyers in this hand. And uh, most uh, ministries environment do have a section on this. At least you can apply to to, um, it's Fali, to make it happen. I hope that helps. So we're almost done with time, but we uh, can certainly take one more question. Is there another one um, out in the audience? Do I see another one? Over there? Yes? Um. Uh, I'm from Kyrgyzstan, Central Asia. My question is to the um, Q representative. As you are working on um, seed collecting with uh, different partners all over the world, do you work with the botanic gardens, um, local organizations, or local community members? We work with a whole range of different partner institutions. Uh, in, in, in our partner countries that might be a government institution, a botanic garden, a research institute, in many cases with the, with the National Forest or Agricultural uh, Center. Again, who the right partner is uh, depends a little bit on the situation in country, uh, on the, 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 the need for plant conservations of which, which type of species, which, which plants are in most urgent need of conservation, and that might well be tree species or crop or relatives or red listed species for which conservation assessment exists, and that might define naturally who the partner in a particular country is. Well, we have finished our time, so I'm going to just wrap up by saying first a very big thank you to Jonas and to Princess Basma for sharing their stories with us today. And also, I think the big uh, takeaway I had from preparing for this conversation and then hearing the, um, the presentations this morning is that initially, uh, I was thinking about how we as a community cross science, horticulture, and education to engage more people in conversations about conservation. But I think the work extends so far beyond those three areas that none of us will run out of work to do uh, in the near term or the long term. So much to be done. And thank all of you for coming and engaging in this conversation today and going forward. Thank you.